Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service. And a special warm welcome to Hector Morrison, who's going to lead us in the service today. So thank you very much. As a call to worship, let's hear uh, words from uh, the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, just from the opening verses. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. We come to God through this same Jesus now in our worship, and we sing uh, the words of uh, Psalm 95, verses 1 to 6. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us uh, now draw near to God in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the words with which we began our service today, reminding us that in your presence is the man, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father, that he is the one who now leads us in worship, in perfect adoration of you, the Heavenly Father, in the communion of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the privilege that we have of coming before you with our songs of praise and our songs of thanksgiving. And we bless you that you are indeed, as we have been singing, you are our maker, You are the maker of all things, 
You are the maker of the heavens and the earth and the one who is about the whole process of remaking us and remaking the whole of creation until at last uh, you will have prepared that new heavens and new earth in which you will dwell the very heart of it all and in which only righteousness will dwell. Father, help us to draw near to you today through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that it is through him that we have access into your presence and through him alone. And so we would come now trusting in Jesus, trusting in Jesus to bring us to yourself, to bring us to your holy hill, Despite its holiness and despite your holiness, we bless you that we can draw near and we pray that we might be touched by your holiness today and indeed embraced by your holiness and safeguarded by your holiness against all who would seek to attack us. For we recognize that uh, we are involved in a battle, a spiritual battle, a spiritual warfare, and we pray that you would enable us to put on the only armor that will protect us uh, in that warfare and in that battle, uh, your own uh, warfare provided for us in and through your word and in and through the gospel. Father, then we pray that you would come close to us this day we pray that this place might be a meeting place between heaven and earth. And what we pray for ourselves here, we pray for every gathering and every congregation of your people, however few in number, however many in number across the face of the whole world today, Father. We bless you for all of these meeting places between heaven and earth. And pray, Heavenly Father, that you're grace would be channeled uh, to your waiting people and to those who will yet become your people in each of these places and in our own presence here. So we ask, Heavenly Father, that you would come to us, that you would speak to us through your word. We thank you that you, you're a God who communicates, a God who speaks, a God who has always been speaking to human beings. And we thank you, Father, that uh, you have given us the Word himself, Jesus Christ, your, your clearest articulation of who you are and, and what you are about and what your purposes are for this world. So give us today the ears that will hear what you are saying and lead us, we pray, into your presence. We pray your blessing on each one gathered here. We pray your blessing on the gospel in these days uh, to the ends of the earth. We bless you for the places where there is gospel growth, and uh, we pray that you would have mercy upon us in, in our own land that has known so much of the gospel in times past and needs a, a fresh awakening of your Spirit, Father, in these days. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon our leaders. Have mercy upon all who seek to lead us in this nation and in our churches, and lead us to yourself, and give us ears to hear what you are saying to us in these days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we ask these things. Amen. Good to see some of the boys and girls uh, with us uh, today. And um, I'm going to think about names this morning. We've all got names. Everybody here has got names. Some people will have just two names. We all have a, a first name and a surname or a family name. Some people, that's all, all I've got is two names. I've got two brothers, and they have three names. They've got a middle name as well, so I don't know why I was left out, but I've only got two names. Any, any of you got three names? Right. Anybody got more than three names? Any of the big ones got more than three names? Wow, somebody's got more than three names. Okay. 
we're thinking about uh, names. Uh, we're going to be looking, when, when you go to your own classes later on today, we're going to be looking at um, a, a verse from John's Gospel from the very beginning. And let me, let me read that one verse for you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that was the name, the Word was one of the names that was given to Jesus. I want us to think about some of the other names that were given to Jesus. You think of some of the other names. There's the name Jesus itself. What does the name Jesus mean? Anyone know what the name Jesus means? Anyone know what the name Jesus means? I think we're going to need help from the older ones today. The older boys and girls here. Anyone know what the name Jesus means? You remember when the angel came to Joseph and told him that Mary was going to have a child and he would have to call the child Jesus? Why was that? Well, lots of work to be done in Sunday school, I think. The older ones. Oh, I know you've got your masks on, but come on. <laughs> yes, Jesus means the Lord, the Lord saves. Can you think of any other names that Jesus has in the Bible? He's got lots and lots of different names that are given to him. The Son of God, yes, very good. Super. Any others? And that talks about his relationship with God the Father. He's God the Son. Yeah, any other names? Anyone know? Yeah. King of the Jews. Excellent. Yes, he's king of the Jews. He's a king. He's king of the Jews. And that was on his cross, wasn't it? Any others? King, king of the Jews, yes. The Messiah. Yes, great. The Messiah. Uh, or another way, Messiah is from a language called Hebrew, and from another language called Greek, the same word means Christ. So Jesus is Christ. Do you know what that means? It means... Miracle worker. He's a what? Miracle worker. A miracle worker. Well, he's certainly a miracle worker, all right. But the word Christ means that he's anointed. He's anointed. And that's because in Old Testament times, way back in Bible times... Uh, kings in particular, when they were becoming kings, they would go on their throne, and nowadays we put a, a crown on the, on the head of the king or the head of the queen, but in those days they used to anoint the king with oil. And that was a symbol of God's help coming upon the king for his job. And Jesus is called Christ because... He was come to be not just king of the Jews, but the king of uh, kings. What, in that verse that I read from the Bible, Jesus is called the Word. Any ideas why he might be called the Word? This is really getting your brains going. Why would Jesus be called the Word? Why do we need words? We need words to speak. And what do, we, what do we speak out? What's in our heads? How would anybody know what we're thinking about if we didn't have words to speak? So Jesus is called the Word, or the Word of God, 
because God has sent Jesus to tell us what God is like and to tell us what we need to do to follow God and to come into the family of, uh, of God. So we're going to be thinking about that uh, later on here in the service. Jesus, the Word of God. Right, I think it's time for our prayer now. Yep. So all say together, boys and girls, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Okay, children, I think it's, it's a time for your own classes now. Our Bible reading this morning is from John's Gospel, from the opening chapter of John's Gospel, the first uh, 18 verses, uh, sometimes referred to as the prologue to John's Gospel. And one of the things about this whole section of the, of the, of the Gospel is that um, we find lots of words are written here, uh, a lot of them simple words but actually words that are important for the rest of the gospel, words that turn up again and again uh, in the rest of the gospel. And it's as if John is giving us a taster. He's saying some things about these words, and as he goes through the rest of the gospel, he just unpacks it, each of the words, more and more fully uh, till the, e the very end of the gospel. Let's hear God's word then. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. And so on. Amen. And may God bless to us uh, the reading of his uh, inspired word. Uh, we're going to sing now um, the hymn Across the land, I think. Uh, holy, 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 yes. Too many papers here. Who don't know which one to look at. Yes, holy, holy, holy. So, uh, Lord God Almighty. Can we turn again then to the passage from which we read earlier, um, John's Gospel, and to the opening uh, words of this passage. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made and so on. 
wonder if you've ever thought about where the gospel begins, where the, the message of the good news, uh, and that's what gospel means, where the message of the good news of Jesus Christ begins. One of the places to look, I suppose, for that is to start looking in each of the Gospels. And if you know your Gospels uh, reasonably well, you'll know that the Gospel writers mark and look. Uh, for them, the good news appears to begin uh, with John the Baptist and the ministry of uh, John the Baptist. Albeit that uh, each of these gospel writers teach us that the ministry of John the Baptist, uh, he came in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. If you know uh, how Matthew's gospel begins, um, you'll know that uh, he begins with a genealogy. Not the most exciting way to begin a book, uh, you would imagine, or indeed for us to begin the whole of the New Testament but it was one of the ways of uh, writing, one of the conventions of writing in, in ancient times. And by starting his gospel with a genealogy in which Jesus is linked through that genealogy uh, to David and uh, to Abraham, he's showing us that the beginning of the gospel was long before even Jesus was actually born. So, uh, Matthew links the genealogy of Jesus to David, who lived about a thousand years before Jesus, and goes even back further than that in the genealogy, linking Jesus to Abraham, who lived about 2,000 years uh, before Jesus. And Matthew did that because Jesus, uh, he wanted to show that Jesus was the fulfillment of promises that God had made to David about a king who would come from him, who would be uh, the Messiah, the Savior, uh, not only of Israel, but the Savior of uh, the world. And of course, uh, Matthew also uh, did that with his genealogy because he was showing that Jesus was also the fulfillment of promises that had been made to Abraham 2,000 years before the birth of Jesus. And Jesus is, of course, the seed that was promised to Abraham through whom all the world, all the nations of the earth uh, would be blessed. So, um, Mark and Luke take us back uh, to... Uh, John the Baptist as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. But uh, Matthew shows that the connection goes back beyond the prophets and beyond the kings uh, and even as far back as uh, Abraham, of whom we read in, in Genesis, in, first of all in chapter 11, at the end of chapter 11 and the beginning of, of, of uh, chapter 12. But for John... John goes back even further back than Genesis chapter 11. He takes us, in the opening of his gospel, he takes us right back to the very beginning of the Bible. He takes us right back to Genesis chapter 1, and indeed to the opening words of Genesis chapter 1, uh, which you will know as the very words that, with which John starts here, in the beginning. And in the beginning is, in fact, the translation of uh, the Hebrew title for uh, the book of Genesis. And in common with uh, many books uh, way back in the ancient Near East, um, Genesis was given its name from the opening words. Uh, in Hebrew, it's Bereshit. In English, it's uh, in the beginning. So when John starts his gospel with these words, he's actually he's doing something very deliberate. He's saying, you know your Bibles? Well, go back to where you find this in the Bible, first of all. Go back to the beginning of Genesis, and he starts talking about that. And he's taking, telling us that the good news goes back as far as that. But in fact, Genesis only starts with the story of creation. In the beginning, God did something. God created the heavens and the earth. In the opening two verses of John's gospel, 
Uh, John is actually taking us back before that. He's taking us back into eternity past. He only begins to talk about creation in verse 3 of his gospel. Up until that point, he's talking about what was before there was ever, uh, ever a creation. So he's talking about what we would call uh, eternity, eternity past. So before uh, the very first action of God that's recorded uh, in Genesis chapter 1, before God created the heavens and the earth, before creation came into existence, what John is talking about here in this opening two verses was already in place. The Word already was. This one is called the Word. He was with God, and He was God. And we're going to try and unpack a little of uh, that today. One of the things that does is actually remind us you think of the question I started with, where does the good news begin? It reminds us, this reminds us that the good news of salvation, of eternal life, has its source uh, before the beginning of there was anything other than God. Uh, it goes back to that beautiful eternal fellowship between God the Father and uh, the Word, His Son, and uh, no doubt also that would be, have been in the communion of the Holy Spirit, who is not mentioned here, though he's mentioned later in the gospel, and is certainly mentioned in the second verse of, uh, of the book of Genesis. So your salvation and mine uh, wasn't something that was thought up yesterday. It wasn't something that was thought up just moments before we came to faith uh, in Jesus Christ, whenever that was. It wasn't something that uh, uh, was thought up 2,000 years ago uh, at the time of David or 3,000 years ago bef um, uh, at the time of Abraham. It wasn't even something that was thought up or, or, or planned thousands or millions or billions of years ago whenever the universe wa was created. It was planned before then. Uh, before there was ever a creation, when there was only God and the Word in the communion of the Spirit. And that's a, a, quite an amazing thought, really, that uh, way back then, the glorious Trinity, uh, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, they had their eye fixed on the future. They had their eye fixed on you and me and all who will come to faith in this world. And more than that, they had their eye fixed on the, the creation that is spoken of in the book of Revelation when it will be the new heavens and the new earth in which there will be no sin and none of the effects of sin because all of that will have been dealt with, all of that will have been taken away. There will only be righteousness in that new creation. So I want us to, to go back. Uh, with John to where the gospel story began and try and grasp a little of this uh, beautiful picture that John gives us here in uh, this uh, opening, opening verse. So that's a little about uh, the beginning of the gospel. It really begins in eternity past. It's as old as that. The gospel is as old as that. It begins in eternity past. For the rest of the time this morning, I just want to unpack a little of uh, this opening verse, uh, which speaks very much about the relationship between God and this person who is called the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the first thing that we see here is uh, that the Word was in other words, the, he's talking about, John is talking about, I mean, he uses very simple words, but he's, used, he's talking about profound things. He's talking about amazing things. Um, but he uses the most, uh, the most simple words uh, to talk about them. The word, he says, in the beginning uh, was the word, or we could translate it, in the beginning the word was. The word already was. What he's talking about there is the what's sometimes described as the eternal pre-existence 
of the Word. In contrast to everything else that John goes on to speak about in verses, uh, in verses three and f- um, verse three in particular, through him all things were made or came into existence. Without him was not, not was nothing made that uh, that has been made. In contrast to these things, the word was. The word wasn't made. The word wasn't created. The word never came into existence. The word always was. The word always had been. There was never a time. There was never uh, a period of time or a moment or a nanosecond when the word was not in existence. As John reminds us again and again through his gospel, uh, in you remember the I am sayings, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. Uh, I am the resurrection and the life. And so on, these I am sayings. Uh, in, in a later chapter, in chapter 8, uh, <clears throat> Jesus could say to the Jews um, who were challenging him, as to who he was and what authority he had. Um, And he could say to them, before Abraham was, I am. And he could equally well have said, before Noah was, I am. Or before Adam was, I am. Because that's what John is, is is talking about here. Before creation was, I am. Before John speaks about creation in verse 3, he tells us that the Word in the beginning already was. And this Word is, of course, uh, the Word that John goes on to speak about later on um, in verses that are, are often associated with us, with the time of Advent and Christmas time. Verse 14, this Word who became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, and made his dwelling among us. John says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So this word uh, is the pre-existent, the eternally pre-existent word. In the beginning, the word already was. He always was. He always had been. The second thing that John tells us is that um, this was also true about the Word. Uh, The Word was with God. So here you have two people together in company, in fellowship. Uh, You have God, and we can think of Him as God the Father, and you've got God the Word, God the Father and, and the Word. The Word was with God. At the very least, it means that the Word was in the presence of God, the Word was in the company of God, the Word was in the fellowship of God, the Word was a companion of God. He shared His life, He shared His experience, He shared fellowship with God. And certainly at a later point in this gospel, In chapter 17, uh, some of you will know that as the chapter in in which Jesus prays what is often called the high high priestly prayer. In chapter 17 and verse 5, uh, Jesus is, is, is heard to say to the Father, this Word who has become flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, He prays to the Father and He talks about the glory I had with you before the world was. The glory I had with you before the world was. So the the Word shared the glory of God, the glory of the Father, from all eternity. He was clearly extremely close uh, to God. But the Greek preposition uh, here that's translated by, by the word with uh, the word was with God. More commonly in the New Testament, it's translated as, it's the simple word for, for towards. And I believe that's the way we should translate it here as well. And what, what John is telling us here is that uh, way back there in eternity, the word was orientated towards God. 
He was turned towards God eternally. He was facing God the Father, perhaps even moving towards God the Father. And that was always the case, eternally the case. In other words, the the Father and the Word for all eternity were in intimate fellowship with the one with the other, in face-to-face fellowship, the one with the other, in that close bonding of relationship, the one with the other. We might even say uh, that they, they spent eternity looking into one another's eyes. Unlike the created angelic beings who later had to to veil their faces in the presence of the glory of God, the Word was with unveiled face before the face of the Father. Daily the Father's delight, as we read in the book of uh, Proverbs, rejoicing always before Him. So the Word and God the Father never took their gaze off one another. Uh, because it was a relationship of eternal love. They never turned their backs on one another. They never turned their face away from uh, from one another because they adored one another. They honored one another. They loved one another. They rejoiced in one another. They rejoiced in one another's company. And that, of course, is what explodes across into salvation because Ultimately, Jesus takes us to be in that place with Him, face to face with the Father, experiencing what He experienced for for all eternity. Of course, that also is one of the the reasons for the, the profound depths into which the soul of Jesus was plunged Uh, in the final moments of His life here. Uh, of his um, uh, life here on earth just before he went to, to, to the cross and on the cross itself. There we, read in the, we read in the Gospels that they are on the cross bearing our sins in his own body on the tree. He cries out, and it's recorded in each of the Gospel writers' narrative about Jesus. He cries the cry of dereliction. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's as if he's crying, why don't I see your beautiful face any longer, Father? Why do I no longer feel the the warmth Uh, the the overwhelming warmth of your smile and your blessing, your benediction upon me? Why don't I see you moving towards me, coming towards me, as has always been my experience of you up until now? Why don't I feel the the strong embrace of your everlasting arms? Father, he's crying, where's the warmth of the affectionate embrace of your bosom. Why is it all gone? Where's it gone to? Why has it all disappeared? Why have you disappeared? I've never experienced this before. But let's also remember that uh, because of that experience of Jesus on the cross because of His experience bearing our sin and experiencing our God-forsakenness. No one who ever trusts in this Jesus will find himself or herself in that place of darkness outer darkness, utter darkness, cut off from the Father. That's the gospel. That's the heart of the gospel. We'll never find ourselves devoid of the light of the Father's countenance shining upon us eternally. No one who trusts in Jesus will ever find herself without the Father's smile and benediction eternally. 
but we will find ourselves, as Jesus promised, we will find ourselves with Christ. We will find ourselves in Christ. We will find ourselves in that place that John speaks of here where he was from all eternity as the pre-incarnate Word, where he has always been, where he is now again and has been since the day of his ascension, where he will always be. And John talks about this in verse uh, 18. Uh, no one has ever seen God but the one and only God who is himself God and who is in the closest relationship with the Father. That's the way the NIV um, translates it here. Uh, it, it's really who is in the bosom of the Father, who is in the embrace of the Father, in the closest possible relationship uh, with, uh, with the Father. That's where we will always be in Christ. but not if we're not in Christ, which is why it's so important to be in Christ. And I pray that we are all in Christ, or if we're not in Christ, that we get into the embrace of Christ by faith, even this very day. Jesus, um, as Jesus, this word Incarnate prays again in that high priestly prayer in, later on in John's Gospel, chapter 17, at verse 25. Father, he says, um, is one of the, uh, Jesus' great asks of the Father, uh, and he doesn't have to drag it out of the Father because he knows this is the way it will be. He's at one with the will of the Father. Father, I want those whom you have given me to be with me where I am, where is Jesus? He is in the bosom of the Father. We will be in the bosom of the Father with Jesus, where He has always been eternally. What John is talking about here, uh, the Word was with God, towards God, in the embrace of the Father, in the bosom of the Father. He has returned to that place triumphant uh, in His um, death and resurrection and ascension, and He is bringing His saints home to that place, one by one by one. Is He bringing you home to that place? Are you ready to trust Him to bring you home? We will not only in that place see what Jesus sees, the glory of the Father, but we will actually be glorified with Him and with that glory. Do you have that hope of being with Christ face to face with the Father? in the heart of the Father, in the bosom of the Father. Well, that's John's, that's why John started writing these words in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and kept writing chapter after chapter, and he tells us that that was his goal as he comes uh, towards, uh, towards the end. It was his goal to bring us to, to that place. And in the process, of course, the word has moved. God has moved heaven and earth to bring us to that place. And the word has moved heaven and earth and moved themselves to the core of their being. And what it cost the Father, which of us can tell? He must have missed that fellowship too with the Son in the darkness of Calvary. So, 
The Word was, <clears throat> and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so John makes it quite clear here, Jesus is God. Jesus is divine. Jesus is part of the Trinity, part of the deity. He's not just speaking about uh, the eternal pre-existence of the Word. He's not just speaking about the closeness of the, of the relationship between this one who is the Word and, and God. He informs us that the Word is none other than God Himself. He's part of the Godhead. Not a God, as the JWs um, like to argue. The Word is not some kind of lesser kind of created God, as they believe. He's nothing short of God Himself, and the, the grammar of, of, of the original Greek at this point makes that abundantly clear. And with this, we, we come really to the, to the high point of John's description of the Word. And it's echoed again towards the end uh, in chapter 20, and 28. Remember when, when Thomas, he's still known today as Doubting Thomas, but uh, he left his doubting behind him. He wasn't Doubting Thomas in the end. He was believing Thomas. He came to an end of his doubting. Maybe you need to come to an end of your doubting as well in your encounter with Jesus. And in the present, he came to an end of his, uh, we read of that in, in, in chapter 20 of this gospel, in the presence of, 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 the, of the crucified and risen Jesus Christ, the incarnate Word of God. This man, Thomas, who had been doubting Thomas, cried out in faith, My Lord, my God. Is that what Jesus is for you? My Lord, my God. And that's the place to which John wants to bring every single person who hears his gospel or who reads his gospel, and he tells us that at the very end of, of chapter tw uh, 20, when he tells us why he wrote what he has just written in the previous 20 chapters. These things are written. There, she says, there's more that I could have written. But I'll stop with this. These things that I've written are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, <clears throat> and that believing you may have life in His name. That's the point to which the apostle wanted to bring each of his readers and each of us, as we read the gospel and hear the gospel, to the point at which uh, we believe that Jesus, this one who is the eternal Word of God, the eternal Son of God, He really is the long-awaited Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. He wants to bring us to the place where on our knees we're ready to cry out in worship with Thomas. Jesus, eternal Word, Word incarnate, you are my Lord, you are my God. And the question for us is simply this, in, in hearing the gospel, in being in that privileged, think of all the people who have never heard the gospel across the world today, and how many times have, have we heard it in that privileged position? Have you come to that place of worship? Not just into a building, to join with people who are worshiping God. Do you believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, Savior of the world, your Savior, most importantly for you, your Savior, your Lord, your God? 
for all time, for all eternity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift that you gave to John to write in such simple words, in what appears to be such a simple way, but to communicate such deep and profound and eternal realities. We thank you, Father, that through this word, you are sharing your heart with us. You are sharing what you are like. You are sharing, you are revealing yourself to us. You've given us that revelation in Jesus Christ. Speak through this word to us today. Speak with a voice that wakes the dead. Make your people hear And for those of us who know you already as the Father who has sent the Word, encourage us through your Word, we pray, to keep on praying for others, to keep on sharing this Word, to keep on speaking, to keep on talking, however hesitantly we do it, and bless the word as we share it in the lives of others so that they will turn, in turn, will come on their knees with Thomas and say, my Lord and my God. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Um, We sing now across the lands, you're the word of God the Father from before the world began.
Now may grace, mercy, and peace from the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon us, remain with us, be our portion, be our experience this day and evermore. Amen.